Hi, this is John Neff, Global Editor-in-Chief of MotorOne.com, and welcome to a new edition of the MotorOne.com US podcast. Today I'll be discussing this week's big news that Ford is investing $500 million in EV startup Rivian. Joining me this week is MotorOne.com Managing Editor, Brandon Turkis. Hey, Brandon. Hey, John. How are you doing? Good, thanks. And the other chair is being filled uh, by writer Christopher Smith. How are you doing, Chris? I'm doing good, John. So the big news broke uh, this morning, the morning we're taping the podcast, that Ford has made a half billion dollar investment in EV startup Rivian. And Brandon, you were online and caught this as it was happening and attended the call and wrote up the report for us. So can you tell us kind of the specifics of uh, the deal that Ford and Rivian have done? Yeah, so the the headlining part of it is that Ford is investing $500 million in Rivian, not General Motors as rumors had had revealed there were there was talk that Rivian was chatting with GM and that clearly fell through. The result of this is going to be immediate uh, in the near term that Ford will build its own model on Rivian's skateboard EV platform. The platform will be built in at Rivian's normal Illinois factory, but Ford hasn't said where the v, where the final production will be, uh, what segment it will compete in, or anything like that. The deal will also see uh, Joe Heinrichs from Ford on the board of directors for Rivian. Did they say at all what uh, stake uh, Ford is taking in Rivian? Is it worth? Is it a, is it a controlling interest? Is it is it under fifty percent? Or did they not mention that? The, they didn't mention that explicitly. It it certainly doesn't seem like uh, it's it's a controlling stake. Um, Rivian seems to have a, still have a great deal of autonomy. Someone on the conference call actually asked if Rivian was still consulting with other partners or whether was, this was exclusive. Uh, it's not exclusive, but for now, it seems that Rivian is content to be working just with Ford. So we'll see what the next four or five years brings if we see other automakers getting into bed with Rivian. Uh, Volkswagen seems like an obvious one considering their relationship with Ford, but I wouldn't count on hearing you know in the next six months rivian saying well we just taken an inv- investment from general motors or toyota or honda or any of the any of ford's main competitors going into this this deal this uh investment what what was ford's current uh pipeline for pure evs that they were developing apart from this and what was what what, what does rivian bring to the table in terms of their products it's been pretty well publicized that ford is going to a new platform strategy that sees it have five modular architectures and it will have a architecture purely for battery electric vehicles. We are already going to see a Mustang inspired crossover. There's going to be a zero emissions F-150 and Ford has been pretty public about bringing out new plug-in hybrids. We've seen it with the new Lincoln Aviator and the new Ford Escape and there's a uh, traditional hybrid in the new Explorer. So the company is firmly on the path of electrification. What the Rivian deal is going to do for them is not really as clear. Uh, It it seems like there's a a bit of overlap, but the company, at least from what we've seen, is promising really, really big numbers for mileage and performance from its platform. So we'll see. Right now, we don't really have an answer to that. Rivian had already debuted two vehicles uh, late last year at the LA Auto Show that were really critically well received. One was a pickup and one was an S, uh, an SUV. So that's where the overlap is. I mean, if Ford's doing an a electric F-150 and Rivian is already planning their own electric pickup, uh, you know, those are technically two competitors in the same space. There was a lot of talk about you know, from Rivian saying, you know, we're marketing towards young active people and we want you know people with an outdoor spirit it sounds almost like you know subaru style like crunchy granola outdoorsy mountain climbing stuff founder of rivian uh rj scaringe scaringe specifically said you know that is the the segment that we're that we're targeting we're targeting young active adults uh and gave the gave the impression that ford is going to be going in a different direction with the vehicle it develops on rivian's platform what are your what are your thoughts on it? I, I think it's uh, on the surface. I think it's great for Ford. I think it's it's too early to tell uh, how good it will really be. Uh, Rivian, you know, they 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 really impressed us at the LA Auto Show and last week in New York with uh, their SUV and their pickup. But 
neither of those vehicles are on sale yet. Uh, it it's still you know we've we've seen a lot of promises from EV makers from uh, Faraday Future and Byton and others that haven't really come to fruition. So it, I think it's still Rivian is still in the place where they can either go in the direction of Tesla or they could go in the direction of Faraday and. Uh, you know, uh, obviously Ford investing that mon- this amount of money into them shows that there's some confidence in what they're going to do. But I think it's entirely too early to say just how good this will be for Ford. And I also think the amount is low enough that we can't really say this is a huge, um, massive thing for Ford. This is not a controlling interest. This is not a multi-billion dollar investment. It's half a billion dollars, which is, you know, you don't sneeze at that kind of money, but this is not, uh, it's, it's not a controlling chair. They're not taking over Rivian. It's, I think it seems a lot more like an exploratory, almost angel style investment. Hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. What about, uh, what about you, Chris? How does this strike your ears? Well, I mean, let's jump right to the chase. Ford, uh, has plans to stop selling sedans and hatchbacks in the United States and they want to sell trucks and SUVs. So partnering up with, uh, an electric company, that right now has a pretty good looking truck and an SUV. It, it seems to make all really well, kinds right? of, of basic common sense. And really, it, in my mind, it shows more direction from Ford um, in the electric realm than what they've done previously. I, 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 what Last year, they dropped $100 million on an electric scooter company. If I remember yeah. uh, a few years ago, they were they were doing something with uh, like, like electric bicycles in Europe. It It's for a long time. It's felt like Ford has really just been grasping at straws, trying to figure out how to make up for this immense amount of lost time uh, where they haven't been doing anything in the electric realm. So my mind on the surface, this seems like a good move for Ford. It it all depends on how they shape it and where they take it from here. And uh, I mean, you look at the new Explorer hybrid, and, and I say new in quotes. I mean, that was a vehicle really that Ford should have brought out 10 years ago. And other automakers were bringing out your traditional hybrids like that 10 years ago. So they have a lot of ground to make up in a short amount of time. And I think their idea is let's just buy some companies that have a little bit more expertise maybe in this than we do. And we'll see where it goes. And I'm with Brandon. It's it's really early to tell right now if this is going to be a, a really good thing for Ford. But I think it shows that they are at least trying to pick a direction and go go there. Yeah, you know, for my take, I, I really like what you said about Ford um, catching up because when you look at Ford's electrification progress, you know, they were really early with uh, hybrids. You know, I think that maybe the Ford Escape was their first hybrid, and that was a, a long time, like three generations of Escape ago. And then they got into plug in hybrids. But none of their plug-in hybrids or traditional hybrids ever reached Prius levels of popularity. They always just, you know, sold sold enough to stick around. And then, of course, Ford had the the Focus Electric, uh, Focus, yeah, Focus Electric or Focus EV. But that was, you know, a few years ago and in a time where a lot of companies were just putting out EVs with sub 100 mile ranges, and they were com- basically compliance vehicles to meet regulations in places like California. Uh, they really, it really wasn't trying, and, and Tesla was wiping the floor with them in terms of technology. But in the meantime, you know, GM has come out with the Bolt, and that's a true, true 200 plus mile range EV. Um, and then you have the um, the the luxury automakers um, like. Mercedes and Audi and, and BMW all about to hit the market or have hit the market with 200 plus mile range EVs. And yeah, for, I, I don't think any of us have seen like what what is Ford going to do? Um, they made the announcements, you know, recently about the um, electric Mustang based or Mustang inspired crossover. And they have talked about the EV F-150, but really all we've seen or, or, or heard about are sketches of it um, or, or clay models. I mean, we're not seeing that prototypes running around. Like It's still kind of vaporware-ish, and it seems like they're trading on the excitement about it more than um, showing us the results. So, um, so yeah, I definitely see a need filled here for Ford in terms of catching up with its competitors because, yeah, it, 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 it wasn't um, on the same path, like the same hardcore electrification path. At the same time, 
I look at Rivian and I was one of the believers uh, late last year around the LA Auto Show when they debuted their truck and SUV. They look great. And of course, you know, they're promising really big ranges like like 300 plus miles uh, and prices competitive with Tesla's. When I step back, they are still part of that group where, yeah, you can make waves by announcing what you hope to do. But until you can show a production ready you know, pre-production vehicle that actually does those things. That's one step. And then the second step is building them at scale, which Tesla will tell you is the hardest part. Um, you can you can create one great vehicle. You can build a pre-production prototype of an awesome vehicle, but to build 5,000 or 10,000 of those a month is a completely different question. So maybe that's where this marriage makes sense. Maybe that's where Rivian gets something um, the production expertise of, of Ford, and Ford gets these kind of great products and great um, engineering technical know-how. Yeah, that de- that definitely seems like it's the case, John. Like it, I think that a big the big motivator for Rivian, and this was referenced during the conference call, was that the company stands to gain a lot with the knowledge from the broader, you know, more general auto industry and building cars at scale. Because I used to think that, you know, if Tesla just partnered with a traditional automaker, then all of their production problems would be solved. But Elon Musk made a good point that it's not the same. Building a battery powered vehicle is not the same as building a traditional vehicle. So they wouldn't learn that much from partnering with a Ford or a GM, because when you involve not only the production of the batteries themselves, but, you know, assembling that with the car, uh, it's very different. That sounds correct to me. Like he didn't go into specifics, even just the batteries. I mean, when you read behind the scenes of what's going on in terms of battery production and having to build gigafactories in order to create the scale needed to make it worth it, but then also sourcing cobalt and the lithium, like automakers are lining up 20 year contracts to get these mineral rights uh, because they see such a big demand for batteries coming. If you're a company that's not planning for that or finds themselves suddenly behind the eight ball, a move like this is is something you got to make. So so we heard this this was this morning, totally no warning that we that this was coming. Um, and it made me think instantly about the other mergers, acquisitions, investments that have happened in the auto industry to shake things up. I, I thought it'd be fun to go around and talk about the ones that stick out most in our mind in the past. So, um, Chris, let's uh, start with you. What's what's a merger, acquisition, or investment from the automotive past uh, that is kind of your favorite or, or most significant to you? Well, I don't know if this would be my favorite, but significant, and uh, maybe I'm showing my age a little bit here as a child of the 80s. Um, I loved the Mitsubishi Starion, the Dodge Conquest, so I've got to point out the uh, the old Diamond Star Motors uh, legacy that actually began with uh, with Chrysler picking up a portion of Mitsubishi all the way back in 1970. A lot of people don't realize just how far back that merger went. And that really helped Chrysler through the 70s just with, the, with their badge-engineered Mitsubishi that they were bringing over. And, uh, and we all love the Dodge Challenger of today, but there was that infamous second-generation Dodge Challenger there, the late 70s, early 80s. That <laughs> I owned one. <laughs> I, you, you seriously owned one. In, uh, in high school, we, yeah. We just, we just became best friends, John. I'm a sucker for unloved cars like those. It was a rebadged Mitsubishi Gallant. But you know what? It was kind of a cool car. And then through the 80s, you had the uh, the Dodge Conquest, the Mitsubishi starring. Of course, everybody's familiar with Eagle Talon, the Mitsubishi Eclipse, the Mitsubishi 3000 GT, Man. the Dodge Stell. High watermark, high watermark. Those are some iconic cars. So you guys got some funny high watermarks. Well, I mean, just uh, go back to that era and those, uh, that, that uh, the Eclipse. And I mean, that was... Those were great cars. Those were at the time. I'm, you know, and then even the even the Dodge Stealth and Mitsubishi uh, 3000. Those were those were great cars too, man. I, I maybe I look at them with rose colored glasses, but yeah, we, we both do. Come up online when they come up online, and I see a mint one, I'm like, oh, I'd love to have that sitting in my garage. The I mean the Eclipse especially. I mean that's I mean that that kind of became. I hesitate to use the word legendary because it, it tends to get overused quite a bit. Um, maybe it's not legendary, but it's certainly it's certainly an iconic car from the 90s. 
if it was good enough for Brian Spillner and Fast and Furious, it's uh, more than good enough for me. And actually, I remember in, um, I, I don't know if it was the first or second Gran Turismo, I optioned up, like I modified a Mitsubishi Eclipse to like 2000 horsepower and all this aero. And it just, I didn't even steer it. I just floored it and it bounced off the sides of the track until it won every race. Now, see, uh, I did the same thing, only it was the 3000 GT. Or in, in Gran Turismo speak, that was the GTO. All right. How about you, Brandon? What's uh, What sticks out in your mind? When we talked about this in the pre-call, I said that I was going to do Daimler Chrysler. And I actually just changed my mind not not five seconds ago. And I want, I'm going to say uh, BMW and Rover. You look at you look at that. Uh, it kind of kept Land Rover alive. It, it revived Mini. I mean, Mini has became a brand because of that BMW takeover, and we have modern cars because of that we have modern Minis because of that. And it made, especially in the early generations, the original Cooper was just amazing. It was just a great amazing piece of design and engineering and it had just enough bmw-ness that you felt a little bit good driving one i i say this as an owner i have one sitting in the garage and yeah i have a it's a first gen it's an 06 it's supercharged which is actually going back to chrysler there's a chrysler engine in that car it's a fantastic little car that showed that you can have this this English style and cheekiness and spirit, but good German engineering. And that was happening really before we had German owned Bentleys and German owned Rolls Royces. And it showed that there was still a lot of life in these British brands that, that could be taken advantage of with the, with the right partner. Yeah. And I think with Mini, I give Mini a lot of credit that it has um, survived, if not flourished in a time when the popularity of small cars just goes up and down with the cost of gas. And right now, you know, the cost of gas is is low in the U.S. So, uh, but many people still have an affection for many, you know, uh, first time mini buyers become second and third time mini buyers, it seems. Uh, so they've definitely done, I would say, uh, way more right than wrong with that brand. Yeah, it's it, it's frustrating to see it now because they're they're definitely in the wrong phase. Uh, it, it is, and the brand is is not doing well. Its sales are not doing well. The products are okay, but they kind of lost that character from the first gen cars they did keep growing i mean every i mean we're on third or fourth generation now of the modern yeah years, they're they're awfully big bigger, yeah minis are supposed to be small so when you create a larger mini it it, it sort of defeats the purpose for me it i mean i've i've driven the larger ones and it's just like i i have no interest in driving the larger ones yeah i mean we gotta we gotta take larger you know consider it relatively uh uh mini or a mini clubman which is i think overall the biggest footprint is about the size of a golf so these are not huge cars i think i think the clubman is longer like has a bigger footprint but the golf or the countryman is taller but yeah the the brand is just in, in an awkward place and i i don't know what uh what the solution to that is but i i'm glad that you know bmw stepped in and elevated them uh to the level that they were at for for a long time well and it's still going i mean uh you know not all of these mergers uh and investments and partnerships we talk about are still in effect today um so when you find one that has stood the test of time a little bit that's impressive and i do need to say brandon i mean astute observation on the bmw rover thing um there is so much british history that people outside that area don't really know much about and that merger kind of helped keep that alive. Even even for the Land Rover brand, there was a if if I recall correctly, there was a time that Range Rovers were carrying BMW engines, and I I think that was before they were PAG. But I'm my timeline around then is a little bit fuzzy. But you know the BMW did a big service for for the British auto industry, keeping those two brands going. All right. Well, I have a pick as well. I'm going to go uh, back to Chrysler. It's easy to <laughs> pick Chrysler for all of these since it is one company that has either bought or been bought by almost every other company. Uh, 
But I'm going to pick from their history, uh, their purchase of Lamborghini back in 1987, um, kind of for its weirdness and kind of for what both brands got out of it. Lamborghini got money, which, you know, obviously every kind of boutique automaker needs to survive. Uh, not that Lamborghini was at the time floundering. Uh, it, it was it was kind of at the tail end of the Countach era. Uh, but that was really its its main car. It had the LM002, uh, but that didn't that wasn't like a volume car. And I believe one other car, I forget which one. Uh, what it got from Chrysler though was money to develop the Countach successor, which was the Diablo. And I'm a huge uh, Diablo fan. That was like right smack in the era I was growing up, and and I ch- I was Diablo over F40 at the time. I've I've kind of changed my tune in the later years. I recognize the F40 for the great car it was, but I loved the Diablo back then, and the fact that it could go like three miles per hour uh, faster on a stop speed than the F40 was uh, a big. Um, uh, point of pride with me and the car I choose to align or chose to align myself with. So I think I think it really kind of just propelled Lamborghini to its next step. And fortunately, Lamborghini has kind of kept growing and and under Audi's stewardship, it's doing really well. But you know, it definitely needed the the Chrysler ownership to take another step to get there. And if all that we got out of it was the Diablo, I'd be happy with that. Um, Chrysler, though, got a, a good amount as well. One thing that that immediately happened was they debuted this concept car called the Portofino, and it was a super weird like uh, design. It, it 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 looked like a four door Dodge Stealth, and the Dodge Stealth wasn't out yet. But it was like a four door Dodge Stealth. All four doors were Lamborghini scissor doors, uh, but like opening up in a suicide fashion. And the engine was mid mounted, so it was behind the seats of a four door. I would put the styling of it as it's got like a Dodge Stealth front end, but this was the first example of cab forward design that really became a marketing catchphrase for Chrysler going forward. And, you know, we get the Dodge Intrepid from that, and the Chrysler 300, and a whole bunch of cars uh, that adopted that. And then, of course, we got the Dodge Stealth itself, which I think, like I said, uh, I look fondly back on that car. I don't know I, really how it came to an end. I know sales uh, started to kind of plummet after the the initial success of the Diablo. Chrysler kind of, instead of Lamborghini making money, it started siphoning money away from Chrysler, um, who I'm sure couldn't afford it at the time. And Chrysler decided to dump it pretty quick and, and that that era ended. But yeah, not before they both affected each other. And I think, you know, two brands with great histories kind of just, you know, uh, meeting for a little bit and then partying again. Definitely one of my one of my favorite investments slash merger slash acquisitions of all time. I remember that concept car, John. And uh, and to add to that, um, I also have a very clear memory. I, I was still pretty young at this point. I have a very clear memory of a Chrysler commercial. And this must have been around 19... 19- 90 or so because it was they were boasting their their performance pedigree and uh and i remember seeing there was the dodge spirit rt in there if, if you remember that uh, that crazy car and they capped off the commercial with the uh with the lamborghini countach i i, I can't remember it, it might have been earlier than 89 90 it, it, it all kind of fades together back then but i have very clear memories of that commercial and I mean, it's the fact that it stuck with me all these years is, I think, a testament to that partnership at that time. Like you just said, um, a, a couple companies meeting in the night for just a little bit. And you know what? They did some good stuff. The, the Viper was being developed at the same time as a concept car. And to think that the same company uh, at the same time was developing the Diablo and the Viper is really cool. And um, I've, I've read that the Viper designer uh, got to get some input uh, to Lamborghini and some design decisions. I'd probably say Lamborghini is doing better right now than uh, the Chrysler, at least the Chrysler brand. Chrysler as a whole is doing really well, but that's more because of Jeep than anything else. Yeah, the Chrysler brand is kind of a, a shell of, of what it once was. It's like I said, it's basically Jeep. They just still call it Chrysler in public. We'd love to hear from everybody what uh, what you think about not only the the Ford investing in Rivian, uh, but our choices for the coolest or most significant investments, mergers, acquisitions. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter at Motor1Com. 
where this discussion will continue. And of course, it's on our website, motorone.com, where you can uh, find all three of us and the rest of the editors and writers in the comments. Uh, so coming up, we'll find out what we've all been driving this week. Uh, before the break, though, a reminder that if you are listening to this online, you can also get our show on iTunes, uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Uh, so why not hit the subscribe button now so you don't miss our show next week. During this part of the show, we talk about what cars we're driving this week. And today we're going to start with Brandon. Uh, Brandon, what are you driving this week? So I've spent the last week with the Subaru Crosstrek plug-in hybrid. And this is this is the new model. This is not the old Crosstrek with the, the standard hybrid engine. This is a plug-in model. It'll do 17 miles to a charge. And it recharges from a wall outlet in about five hours, which is... Really good for the amount of mileage that you get. It's uh, it's a usable amount of time. So if you're the type of person that even if you have a longer commute to work, if you have a way of charging up while you're there, you can conceivably cut gas out of the equation for the most part. I've really enjoyed my time with this car. I, I'm i in a bit of a unique situation that I work from home and I rarely have to travel very far. So it's been very easy to, for me to keep it keep it charged up and take advantage of the of the electric range i'm averaging about 45 miles for the gallon right now the combined city figure is around 35 i think so uh, it's doing really really well at at, uh on fuel it's it's very comfortable to drive just like the standard cross track now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the powertrain for the Subaru Crosstrek plug-in hybrid comes from the Toyota uh, Prius Prime, the plug-in hybrid version of the Prius. Um, it's a it's a product of their uh, partnership on on some hybrid stuff. Yeah, uh, the, there are there are bits and pieces that are shared between them. It's it's not a straight one for one thing, uh, as Clint Simone covered in Motor One's first drive of the of the Crosstrack plug-in. There's there's some parts commonality, but not quite as much as you might think. It's still it's still got a lot of Subaru character to it. It's uh, it drives like a Subaru. It does not remind me of a Toyota at all. I will say I, I like the idea of a plug-in hybrid that is uh, skews a little bit more on the side of like adventure traveling uh, than most other plug-in hybrids that are like you know either urban vehicles or they're just not not like adventure vehicles, not like rough and tumble kind of stuff. The the Crosstrek does have you know a raised um, ground clearance. It can go off road a little bit, so that's cool. And it's all wheel drive. Not a lot of plug in hybrids are, are all wheel drive. Right, and it's it's always all wheel drive. It's not uh, you know there's not a differential suddenly switching around and saying ta da I'm I'm no longer front wheel drive. I'm all wheel drive. It's it's always there all wheel drive. It does have that kind of off road ability. There's an X mode, I believe it's called for going off on the trails and i didn't really use that it it's nice to have that ability i don't think most consumers are going to use it as much as subaru wants to market and say that that people will use it um my main concern with it especially for the people that would want to go off-road and want to be in the outdoors and kind of you know really feed into that that subaru uh aesthetic and character is that the battery pack instead of putting it in the floor like it is for most crossovers it's in the trunk and it takes up a substantial amount of cargo space you're not going to put a you know a golden retriever in the back of this car he will not be very happy with you so this is easily the least dog friendly subaru there is it it beyond taking up space in the in the cargo hold one of the things that you might not necessarily think about is that because of where the battery pack is at right on the bottom of the trunk it increases the liftover height by probably at least eight inches to a foot. It's a big difference in how much you have to lift things over the bumper and over the battery pack to get it into the cargo hold. I'll give it props for being probably the least expensive all-wheel drive option for a plug-in hybrid because I I bet uh, once you go above that, you're looking at luxury SUVs that are plug-in hybrids from BMW, Mercedes, uh, Range Rover. You know, there's not really any, not that I can think of, all-wheel drive in like the $30,000 range. This car starts at $35,000. Mine is the only option package, which is a sunroof and heated seats and navigation and it rings up at about 38 that's before a $4,500 federal income tax credit. So that, that softens the blow a little bit. 
I think though that um, 17 miles of range just is not enough in a plug-in hybrid. I think 30 should be the minimum of that. To me, that's the minimum of practical usability. That is that is a very valid point. And like I said, I've I've been in the unique case where I can keep it charged all the time. It's, I don't necessarily need that range, but even when I do need to go the entire way, I stretch the charge out to about 23 miles over over Easter weekend. And so I, I think there's a little bit of sandbagging here because I was not babying and I was not driving it conservatively. I was driving it the same way I would drive any plug-in hybrid. And I I made it, you know, up to my from my house up to my parents' house and about a mile or two back before the gas engine kicked in and I looked it up, it's it's twenty two, twenty three miles. So there's there's definitely I think there's a little bit of sandbagging going on in in that total number. I think it might be a little bit conservative. That's, that's good to hear. It's it's more than expected. But Chris, you you're joining us from South Dakota. Is there anywhere that you drive that is less than 17 miles away from you? <laughs> oh yeah, I mean I mean I'm in Western South Dakota, I'm in Rapid City. So I'm I mean I'm just a couple miles from downtown. But honestly, once you get out of Rapid City, yeah, it's it's, it's pretty empty. Oh, would a plug-in hybrid with 17 miles would that make sense to you at all? I mean, maybe one with 30 miles wouldn't make sense to you either. But um, you know, I mean, if you lived if you lived in the city and we're working in the city here, I, I mean, it, it would make sense. But outside of that, I mean, yeah, it's um, I, I think Sioux Falls is probably the uh, the, the next largest uh, city outside of Rapid City. That's four hours away. Denver is six and a half hours. But there is two things that you have to keep in mind here, John. And, and the first is the price. It, it's $35,000. It's not, and there's a $4,500 tax credit. So that's not crazy for, for what you're getting. And it's always on all wheel drive. The reason that it doesn't have more mileage is because you're giving up that range for all wheel drive. I would say the all wheel drive is its selling point. I would say its price is not because you can get an all electric bolt with 240 miles of range for that price um you could even look well it, it would cost more in the end but it, you could look at a tesla model 3 for that if you wanted when i when i look at plug-in hybrid vehicles I, and and maybe other people are different i want the all electric range to be able to cover 90 plus percent of my driving like my i wanted to cover my daily routine driving completely and then i want the gas engine there to be able to go on the longer trips that, you know, uh, that are outside of my daily routine. And I just don't think that for, for me, and I live in a suburb where, you know, I, I don't take that long a trip, uh, for doing errands and things, but, uh, on a, on a Saturday driving around doing errands, I don't think 17 miles would do it, uh, but 30 would. So, um, so yeah, I'm, a, I'm on the fence with the, with the cross track. I think it, like I said, Having the all-wheel drive is a selling point for sure, and and maybe they can bank on that and sell a few. But you know, compared to uh, almost all other plug-in hybrids, seventeen miles is on the very short end uh, of that spectrum. Um, all right, let's move on to uh, Chris. Chris, what are you driving this week? Well, obviously in uh, Western South Dakota, I'm not in the uh, media fleet, so we're going to look at the secondhand market at my 2004 Mazda 6S five door hatchback, which will have to be pried from my cold dead hands. I know, John, you wanted me to talk about the Mustang. Maybe we can do that next time. No, no, no. I want to talk about the the six because it's such a unique vehicle, and I don't think many people remember that Mazda sold a hatchback, a four door hatchback version of the the six back in those days right um and it goes back to americans just believing that hatchbacks must be tiny little cheap runabout cars and obviously that's changing now a little bit as we're seeing higher end automakers creating their lift backs they're still not calling them hatchbacks it's really a shame because this mazda i i sought it out specifically because i wanted that extra practicality and i always like the look of the uh, of the six as a sedan um, of course, it's. I mean, the the bones are Ford Fusion, and honestly, I've driven the Fusion of the same era, and I I really hated that car, and the and the six just feels completely different. It just it has that zoom zoominess that Mazda likes to inject into it into the cars. And as far as practicality goes, I've literally hauled a washing machine 
in this car. This isn't a wagon. This is this is the you know the four door sedan with. I hauled a washing machine in the car. I've hauled a desk in the car with the hatch with everything closed. The the practicality is oh, insane. Wow. Uh, I thought you meant with the, with the hatch open. No, no, the the hatch was completely closed. Everything is completely closed inside. Um, wow. The the space, the the, What's the engine in it. Um, it's it's the the three liter twenty four valve V six. Um, I believe it was rated at. 220 horse back in the day somewhere around there but uh then mazda kind of rounded that number down a little bit in later years um i mean it's 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 enough to be entertaining i'm not gonna go winning any stoplight uh stoplight battles but uh, i mean it has plenty of power to be entertaining the the handling continues to surprise me and uh, i think it looks great it's it's kind of an unsung car i i try to recommend that car as much as i can just because if you want something that actually looks good, that's fun to drive, that has some legitimate cargo capacity, it's it's there are very few cars out there that uh, that can match up to that. And and, and you're not going to see a million million of them out there. No, you really don't. There I, there are two things about the this that generation of six that are really fantastic. I love them, and I remember them from my brief brief time driving that first gen car the first is that the liftback model gets a rear windshield wipe, wiper correct yes every normal car should have that every single one as standard it, it, i i loved that that was on there and also that does yours have the manual transmission unfortunately no it's the automatic uh which my wife loves and and i mean honestly it's it's um it's the five-speed automatic. I believe they went to the six-speed automatic uh, in 2005. And really, uh, the six-speed automatic would be a little bit better on the car. It, uh, the five-speed has uh, just uh, some odd gaps in it. But, uh, I mean, the shifting is crisp. It does have the manual mode where if, uh, if I want to, I can just let it bounce off the rev limiter all day long. It won't automatically shift. Um, not that I do that on, on purpose, but... Uh, Every now and again, if I want to get a good launch in first gear, it uh, first gear just goes way too quickly, and uh, and it'll and it'll bounce off the limiter. Um, a friend of mine had a five speed, and uh, it's I, I mean it's it's a fun car to to roll the gears on. Um, the engine that V six, even though it's the three liter V six, it's it's kind of down on torque. So with the automatic. Um, I almost liken it to uh, a, a turbo car with a little bit of turbo lag right off the beginning. Uh, it's, it could be a little unnerving at first, but then once it gets up on cam, it just kind of takes off. Very nice. Well, I, I always leave it to you to find cars that other people have forgotten about or, um, you know, trims that 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 time has forgot. So uh, great choice. And I'm glad it's in your garage. As for me, I've driven two cars this week, and it seems like this is our week of electrification because both of both of the cars I've driven uh, are electric to some degree. So for most of the week, I was driving a, a Range Rover Sport plug-in hybrid. I've driven the regular Range Rover, a diesel version, and I really love this generation of the Range Rovers. Uh, I had some trouble with this uh, with this plug-in hybrid version of the Range Rover Sport. Uh, particularly, I couldn't get it to charge at my house. Uh, I was just charging it through, trying to charge it through a regular one pen outlet, and it was tripping my uh, GFCI plug. And and yeah, I just couldn't get it to charge. So I pretty much had to treat it like a normal hybrid. Um, and to be honest, without that, uh, the the thirty miles of range it provides for EV. Uh, I, I didn't really like driving it in um, regular traditional hybrid mode the whole time. I mean, if, it, if I were if I were going to be driving it like that, I'd rather have the diesel or one of the gas engines. If I did have the electric range to play with and recharge every night, I think I would have would have liked it more. And then today, I am rather than um, calling you from my home office in Cleveland, uh, I'm down at Motor One HQ in Miami. And we've got um, a Chevy Bolt this week. So I took that to lunch with senior editor Jeff Perez. And um, and that's my first time driving a, a Chevy Bolt. It was about what I expected, but I'm, I'm always amazed by pure electric, pure electrics and kind of the the nature of them, you know, with the, the all the weight being down uh, at the bottom of the car because of the batteries. Um, just the nature of their acceleration, even though the, the Bolt is not a hot rod like a Model 3 or a Model S, it's still very quick. And the Bolt definitely feels kind of like an economy hatchback. Um, you know, 
you know, it's definitely not like a, like a Tesla or any of the German cars in terms of their build quality or anything like that. But man, I just love the nature of electric cars. And so I had a blast driving uh, to get some hot dogs at lunch, accelerating too hard, turning too fast. And so I have a pretty, pretty good outlook for the next 10 years with all of this electrification um, happening and all the news that's being made like uh, this week about Rivian and Ford, I'm excited for the next chapter. I don't, I don't bemoan the demise of the gas engine because I don't think it is going to demise. I think there's a long time to go for electric cars to command significant chunks of market share. Um, and I just love the way things are going. I think it's an exciting evolution and, and changeover in the market that we get to watch. Have you guys driven the Bolt? I adore the Bolt, actually. I think it's, uh, I, first of all, full disclosure, I am from the town where the Bolt is built. I used to drive by the factory regularly. So buy the Bolt. It's, it's good for my hometown. I like it. <laughs> um, but no, it, it, it drives really, really well. It's, it's, you know, it, it is kind of an, a, an economy hatchback, but, it's one of those EVs that it's easy to forget that you're driving an electric car. I've not driven the Bolt, but I'm with you, John, on on the whole electrification thing. Back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, when the automobile was first coming about, you know, you absolutely know there was somebody saying that horses were far superior, that these new fangled mechanical horses just didn't have the same feel they didn't have the same passion and and it's it's called progress and i love a roaring gas engine as much as anybody but i also love the immediacy of an electric motor and once you have a proper ride in a high performance electric car and you just feel that in, that initial kick it's it's something that you never forget so I'm I'm very much looking forward to the future of electri- electrification. So that reminds me, uh, and this is going to be a tangent, uh, a very typical John F. tangent of the. It reminds me of the movie Sea Biscuit, where the the lead character, the guy who buys Sea Biscuit, originally was into horses. Then he uh, saw cars, and he you know predicted that cars would be the next big thing, and he invested a bunch of money into them and he he had a car dealership and that's how he made all his money uh and then his son was out driving uh his truck and and drove it off a cliff by accident and died and then he all of a sudden couldn't look at another car he wheeled all the cars out of his barn and, and filled it all with horses again uh including seabiscuit uh but it just reminded me of of you know that period where horses were the big thing and it took a lot of people believing in something else to supplant that and show them that, you know, this is this is progress. This is better than than the thing that's been around. And I agree. I think the same thing is happening with electric vehicles. And it's still pretty early, but the technology is advancing so fast with longer ranges, better charging, better charging infrastructure, lower prices, all of that. And there's still a lot of hurdles to go. Um, but you know, I, I think nobody's asking for it to be, to happen overnight. Uh, and it, it's certainly happening at a pace I'm okay with. Um, you know, and like I said, I don't think gas, gas engines or gas powered vehicles are going anywhere anytime soon. And even they're advancing as well. I mean, just the, you know, average fuel economy of, of brands. And, and in fact, horses now, and I think it was, a. Um... I think it was James May that did something a while ago, or, or maybe it was was it, it was Leno? Leno? It was Leno on Top Gear. That oh, that's was, right. Was that's in right. the start a reasonably priced car segment. Yes, yes. Where he said, you know what, uh, the the way things are going now, it could free up the uh, the gas engine to be more of a pleasure vehicle, while we have electric or autonomous vehicles that we use for the daily grind. And there's always there's always going to be passion in automobiles as long as there are things rolling on four wheels. Yeah, and the, the funny thing, though, is I think that electric motors, electric uh, you know, powertrains actually lend themselves so well to the part of in automotive enthusiasm that we like. I mean, they are, they are better performance machines than, than gas-powered cars. I mean, right now we're waiting for the Volkswagen IDR um, that has already broken records around the world to uh, break the lap record at uh, the Nurburgring um, because 
you know, an electric powered race car can pretty much do everything a gas powered one can, but better. So we'll, and that should be happening in, in I think a, a few weeks or so. That brings us to the end of our podcast. Um, you can follow Brandon on Twitter at Brandon Turkis, and you can follow Chris at CH Writing. And you can follow me on Twitter at John underscore M underscore Neff. I want to thank you two for being here with me on the podcast this week. Always a pleasure. It was a good time as usual. And then uh, thank all of you out there for listening and we'll see you next week.